Bye, shalom. If you missed it in the beginning, uh, we have calendars in the back. If you like one, they're back there. It costs us ten dollars for them, but if you don't have that, you can just take one. This week, uh, uh, it was a pretty interesting week. Most, I guess, most weeks are pretty interesting, but. Um, this, this past week, I, I was thinking of a couple things that really stood out to me. And I, last week, last night, I told some people who came over for Friday night, uh, usually at the Ham's house, about how this week God had put in my heart to a couple times to bring uh, this book with me that I have read recently. And, um, and a couple times this week, told me to bring it places I wouldn't think to, to bring it. And, um, and then... He laid in my heart to give it to someone, and each time the person accepted it very, I was like, man, thank you so much, you know, and, um, and one of the times I was going to a meeting at work with the executive staff of the people at uh, my job, and I just, God had laid in my heart to bring it with me, and I was like, man, who am I going to give this to here? Like, who would I, why would I, like, I kept going back and forth. Like, man, there's no reason for me to bring this. Like, why, why would, I mean, I'm just going to be walking into this meeting with this book, and I'm going to look like an idiot. And, like, people are going to ask me, like, hey, why do you have that? Why are you bringing that with you? And um, I was like, okay, I'll bring it. I have another book that I take notes, and I'm just going to put it behind it, and I'll, like, hide it like this so that no one will see it. And uh, it's like, and hopefully no one, and I'll leave it when I get to my table. I'll leave it under there so no one can see it, you know. Um, and I was thinking, man, there's, uh, why, why in the world am I bringing this? So then I, I bring it, go to the whole meeting, kind of forget about it. Um, and then I, I start talking to a guy that I work with pretty often who's a, a pastor at another church. Um, he's gone through a bunch of, like, hard times. He, his father was a pastor of a church of, like, 600, and he was a pastor of a church about 100 himself. And um, his father and his his stepmother both passed away from COVID um, within a month of each other a few months back. And he's kind of had to take on these two, his regular church and this other church. It's like 700 people in total. And um, so we were talking through this and talking about like messages and how a lot of times it feels like it's a burden to, to come up with a message. And it feels like it's like a lot of times I read scripture to look for the message. I'm, I'm reading to say, God, okay, what is the message this week, you know, and I have to prepare for that, and, and I said, I'm like, I only got to do it, like, twice a month, you know, and he was doing it every week, twice a week, you know, he does Wednesday and Sunday, and I was like, man, that is hard, and I was like, it seems like a lot of times I read, if I don't have a message to teach, I'll just read scripture, like, I just want to know you, God, I just want to let me read through this, I said, but when it's my turn to teach, I'm always like, Okay, what's the message this week? I'm reading through Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. What's the message this week, God? Oh, go, let me let me find the message. And um, one of the things I was telling him, I had read this book, and, and the guy was saying that really you should just search search for God, and that you should just search to know Him, and that God's going to give you a message. It might be the day before, it might be later, like right before you get up there. But God will give you something as long as you're just searching for Him. He was like, Oh man, that sounds really good. What book is that? I was like, Well, I actually have it right here. <laughs> And uh, so then I ended up giving it to him. He's like, man, I'm going to take this as, as I'm gonna say, take this as God has given me this, and I'm going to read it that way. Um, but it was just really cool because, like, I didn't have in my mind someone to give it to. I just was following what the Spirit leading me. And um, so that was a cool thing this week. But I was going through this week, you know, doing what I do, looking for a message. And um, at first I had, I thought the very first thing when I read through the portion I was like, this is the message I'm supposed to teach, and what I'm going to teach right now. Now, I went through a little bit longer, a little bit later, and God started laying a different message on my heart, and um, kind of like a follow-up of last week about how we were made new, and then I was going to teach on how to renew your mind, and uh, the process of memorizing scripture, and scripture you can memorize to renew your mind, so that you are starting to think on those things instead of the, the lies of this other world. And I went through that, and I kept going back and forth throughout this whole week. And then on Friday, and it was, it was hard to even prepare for the message, because I was like, which one am I supposed to do? It's hard to even prepare, because I didn't know. 
So then on my way to that meeting, it's like God brought this peace over me and started just like pouring into me this, this message here. And um, so I had to think, like, why, why, did, why was it like that? Why would he do that? And I think that many of us, we make decisions throughout the week whether we're going to go to church or not, whether we're going to like show up or not. And there might have been one message for somebody else that's supposed to be here, and there's another one for somebody else. So my thought is that this is for somebody here. And the reason he did this one, because someone decided to show up today that might not have decided it yesterday. And uh, so you can take that as being from him, that this would be from him for you. Um, so the title is Declaring God to be Our God, and what we, de- what we give to God declares who he is to us. And um, I took that from Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 19. It's the first thing we read today. And uh, I was telling my mom this morning before uh, in, in the prayer portion how like, I see God moving all around us. Right now, uh, Matt's at a, a men's retreat at, for a Baptist church, and a Baptist church asked him to be the, the leader of it, uh, to be the spiritual leader. So you have this messianic guy that's being asked to be a spiritual leader at a Baptist church, and they're hosting it for a, it might be a Methodist church, and what, the, the, what's, what is the theme that God is starting to bring his people together? And in that... Just recently, a couple weeks back, Matt went to this other conference, and it was like a bunch of Messianic people coming together to proclaim that, hey, look, we have to get back to the gospel, get back to teaching Yeshua and teaching how he is our salvation and going out and proclaiming the gospel to those around us. It's like the same thing that we've been kind of experiencing here. Like Our focus has to change. Not to say that we don't obey God, just our focus must change. And to me... I'm starting to see this all over, even in, in the other denominations in our area, that it's starting to be that you must be fully committed to Christ and that your life is not your own and that you cannot keep on focusing on things that won't matter for eternity. And it's like all over. And that's just, a, we know that's the message of God. We understand that. But I was telling them earlier in prayer that about two or three years ago, Joel Sanchez came up here and taught a message. And in that message, he said, in the Messianic movement, God's going to do a great move. He said that those who are focused on names and on the small things, not focused on the big things, God's going to separate them. He's going to remove them from the body. And then that's exactly what's happened. That God has removed those from the body that were focused on the things that didn't matter. Because you don't see it anymore. I, like, even when you see on posts on Facebook or on social media, you rarely see those people who are talking about names or all these little issues that don't really matter. It's coming back to the gospel of Christ and that the kingdom of God, and that we must be focused on that. And hopefully today that this message encourages y'all, but we're also on this, this time of Elul, of repentance, preparing ourselves for the king. We're, we're right now, it's supposed to be this time that we are looking at ourselves and being introspective to say, am I putting on these garments of Christ? Am I putting on these garments that when this, the Messiah comes, that I'm a bride clothed in white? So in doing that, we're looking at our actions and our heart to say, are we living for him or for ourselves? So here we'll go to Deuteronomy. Hopefully the slides won't mess up. So it shall come to be when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the fruit of the produce of the ground, which you shall bring to your land that the Lord your God has given you, and put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to, to the Lord, to Yahweh, your God, that I have come to the country which Yahweh swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of of the Lord your God. And you shall answer and say before Yahweh your God, My father was a Syrian about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, few in number. And there he became a, a nation great, mighty, and populous. 
But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. And then we cried out to the Lord our God, our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction, our labor, and our oppression. So Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great terror, with signs and wonders. So, so far, what, what do we have? He said, hey, look, I want you to go and give this offering to God. And in this offering to God, I want you to come there and remind yourself of this story of your salvation. You're going to come back and you're going to say, hey, look, I remember that I once was this Gentile. And in my Gentileness, I, we were brought into Egypt, into bondage, into slavery. And I want to remind myself that you, God, saved me from this sin. Or you, God, saved me from Egypt. And that's what he's trying to tell us here, is that we had this reminder on a yearly basis. We come back to God. God, I remember you're the one who saved me. So he has brought us up to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now behold, I have brought the first fruit of the land which you, O Lord, has given me. So one thing in that last little part, when you're being reminded of your salvation, he says like you're reminded of saying that you were brought out by what? The right hand of God. This right hand has saved you. So it's this reminder that Jesus, Yeshua, has saved us. Then it comes here. And it says, when he has brought us to this place, has given us this land, a land filling, <coughs> flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first fruit of the land which you, O Lord, has given me. So we come back and we're giving this offering back to God, recognizing that he has saved us, right? Then you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given you, and your house and your Levite and the stranger who is among you. So what do we do? We, we come back, we're giving this offering to God, and then we're rejoicing to him. Hey, you've saved us. You have saved us from this bondage that we once lived in. And we do that, right? We had these feast days that we come when we were celebra celebrating this freedom that God has given us, this freedom to walk after him and his ways. When you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled. So who's he say to give it to? The Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithes from my house and also have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, according to all your commandments which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandment, nor have I forgotten them. So this is like the, the point that we're saying, hey, God, I have given you all that I'm supposed to give you to show you that I have obeyed you, to show you that I have committed my heart to you. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning, nor have removed any of it for unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you've commanded me. So God, I've given it all to you. Whatever is yours, I've given. This first fruits, I've given. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to, your, to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. This day, Yahweh your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore, you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. So in the same way, this is like a quotation, right? How should you love God with all your heart, with all your soul? And then he says, you should obey these with all your heart and with all your soul. And what is the love of God? If you love me, you will obey me. So like this, he's saying it the same way here. Like, hey, you should do these things with all your heart, with all your soul, with all that you are. Give this gift to him. It says, today you proclaim to the Lord to be your God. So in this process of giving up your first fruits, you have proclaimed that God is your God, right? So like I'm saying by me giving this, so if I was to come and give this Bible to, to God, i say, God, this is yours, then I would be proclaiming to him by that action that he is my God. So that's what's saying here, this first fruit that you're giving to God. It says that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. Also today... The Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people. 
So not only in this offering that we give back to God of our first fruits, are we proclaiming him to be our God, him in that he is proclaiming us to be his people by our obedience to him. What? And today the Lord has proclaimed to you to be his special people, just as he's promised you that you should keep all his commandments. That he will set you high above all nations, which he has made in praise and name and honor, that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. So in this, what do we see? That we are told to give the first of what we harvest. So the first. That would be, I wouldn't wait until the very end to make sure I have all that I have. I would give the very first of what I harvest. So in trust that I'll have enough to live off of later, right? So then... In doing this, we are what? We are declaring that God is our God and that we're going to obey him. So I'm saying, hey, God, because I trust you as my God, I'm going to give you the very first of what I have, and then I'll trust that you'll provide the rest of it when I need it. In this, God will declare you as his people. So it's not only us declaring him as our God, he's also declaring us to be his people. So there's a, when you look through Scripture and you look at offerings that we give to God, there's a common pattern of what we give to God, right? We give the first, almost all throughout Scripture. So like even whenever they would count out, you're going to give the tenth of your flock. You would say you give out number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We're going to give eleven. So there's all this common picture of you're going to give the first, you're going to give something that's unblemished, and whatever he designates as his. So sometimes he would say, hey, you need to give this kind of animal or that kind of animal. Or sometimes he'd say, you need to give this much. So there's these three common things inside our offerings back to God. It's the first, the unblemished, and whatever he designates as his. So we're going to take this somewhere else. This is 1 Chronicles 29, 13, and 14. It says, now therefore our God, we thank you and praise you glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of, of your own we have given you. So the view here in First Chronicles is not that I'm giving God my own. The view is that I'm giving God what is his. And nowadays, our view of giving to God is really that man, I've earned all this money, or I have all this stuff, or I've made all this stuff, or I've got to give a little of my time, or I give a little bit of my stuff, I'm giving this to God. And a lot of times we feel pride because we've given something to God that we think is ours. We're like, hey, I'm giving that to God. Man, look at me. Look what I've done. I've given something to God. But the view of Scripture is that God owns all that you have. That God made you and gave you your talents. He made you and gave you your skills and abilities. And that whatever you give back to him is already his. That's the view of Scripture. That, that the money that you have, you should view it as his. And you're only proving that he is your God. And you're only showing the world that he is your God and you are his people. And when you give back to him, it is just to show him that, hey, I believe that. It's already yours. But I believe it that you are mine. Our view needs to be that all that we have is God's and process things that way. We are giving to God what is already his. When we don't give to God what is already his, what are we doing? So if I don't give to God what is already his, what am I doing? I'm stealing from him. So this past week, uh, I was talking with Josie, my youngest, and um, she had, Elle came, I think it was Elle, Elle came and asked for a sucker. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can have that. And Josie said, wait a minute, that's my sucker. Riley gave that to me for my birthday. She can't have that sucker. And, but Josie didn't want the sucker herself. She just didn't want Elle to have it. And I was like, Josie, you want some of this ice cream right here. This is my ice cream. I'll share with you. 
if you'll share with Elle. She was like, no, that ice cream is all of ours. <laughs> that's, that's not yours, Daddy. That's all of ours. And I was like, wait, Josie, I bought the ice cream. She was like, no, 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 that's all of ours. That's just everybody's ice cream. That's not really just yours. And I said, Josie, no, all this in the house is mine. She's like, no, 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 that's all of our stuff. That's not yours. We're not really sharing. And I, and I was like, that's exactly how we view things. <laughs> that whenever I give back to God my time, my money, my possessions, anything, this is really mine. When in reality, it's all his. And the view of us should be that it's all his. That all that we have is his. So then when we look to spend money, we look to spend our time, we look at it as spending his money and his time. Instead of it being, I'm spending my money. So, and that's funny with Josie. It's like, oh, but we had that same attitude. We were like, no, 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 no. That's not really yours, Daddy. That's not the same thing. Riley gave that one to me, so that one's mine. But that's the same attitude that we have. So, because Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. And not, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here he's saying, hey, look, you are the sacrifice. You are the thing that's being given up. Your whole self, we are saying I'm giving to God. We make this commitment to God. We say, hey, God, I want to follow you. God, I want to obey you. I'm saying I'm giving you all of me. That no longer am I my own, I am his. So what part do we give? The first, the unblemished, and what he prescribes. So in that, like I think of myself, this past week God was really convicting me of uh, just prayer. And I, I pray throughout the day. I'm one of those people who I, pretty often, a lot of times I stop at work and I'll pray but really convicted me about giving the first to him. And I wake up pretty early. I wake up like at 4.40 most mornings. And I was like, well, I don't want to wake up any earlier. My excuse has been I don't want to wake up any earlier because I don't want to wake up Christy. I don't want my alarm to go off and wake her up. And if I wake up any earlier to pray, then I'm going to wake her up. I was like, God, if you really want me to pray, will you wake me up earlier? So like every day this week is about me up at 4 o'clock to, to pray. And I didn't set my alarm. Um... Because, like, he's saying, I should get the first. Instead of, like, I get the end of your day, I get your last offering, I get whatever's left over, I want the first. I want the best. I want the unblemished. I don't want when you're tired and that you're like, hey, get some done now. I guess I'll, whew, I'm tired and ready to go to bed. Maybe I'll read the Bible until I fall asleep. And you can have that part, God. I'll give you the end of it. I'll give you the end of my day. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you, have, whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So saying, hey, look, when you've made this commitment to Jesus, you made this commitment to Yeshua, that you are no longer your own, that your life is no longer yours. So when you go and you're using things and you make your whole life about you, and then you, we come back to God and we'll say, God, I don't have time to come and worship you. I don't have time to go and serve you. We've now made it all about us. And our life is my own, and I'm not giving any of it to you. Or I don't have time to give any of it up to you. And that is our view. That, oh, yes, I go to church. Look at me, I go to church. I'm doing the bare minimum. Your complete view is wrong. You are completely lost. The view should be that I have now given up myself, my whole self, I've given up to you, God. 
And that when I come to worship you on the Sabbath or I come to serve you, I'm just showing that you're my God. I'm just coming back to tell you, God, I believe that you are my God. And you're confirming back to me that you are my God. Because I've given up what you prescribed. Whenever I say, hey, I don't have time for that. I won't have all these other things I want to do. I'm just going to give God my leftovers. I'm, I'm full now. God, you can have this. I'm good. I'm, I don't need any more water. I'm good. You, you got it now. And that is much of our lives. Is that we're going to give God what's left. I have a little money left over in the, in the, in the month. I'm going to give that to God. I have a little time left over in the day. I'm going to give that to God. We don't have anything going on on Saturday. I'll give that to God. I don't have any, maybe this week, I don't have any time left over. Uh, I think we'll be free on Sunday. I don't got anything to do. Maybe I'll go serve somebody on Sunday. Because I don't got nothing else to do. Maybe I'll give that to him. And that is our view of God. So but here he says that you are the temple of God. That you are. The Spirit of God lives in you. What are you putting inside his body in this temple? Like our view should be that, hey, when I'm sitting down to watch TV, I'm sitting down to, to speak with people, what am I putting inside his temple? When I go to sit down to eat, what am I putting into his temple? What am I putting into his mind? What are ways that we can give our body to Christ, right? Our view should be, hey, God, you have blessed me. You have saved me. You have redeemed me. Your right hand has saved me. What can I give to you with what you've blessed me with? That should be the view. But it's like somehow you know how our view has changed? Because right now, what do we do? The world is out here, and I'm looking at the world, and, man, I'm feeling pretty good. Because I look at the world. They're all serving themselves. They don't do these things. When there's the Messiah right here who's given his life for you. And the picture should be, the view should be is looking at him. That is my example. But as long as you look at the world around you, you're going to feel really good about yourself. You're going to be feeling really good about giving those leftovers over. Hey, I'm giving him my leftovers. They're not giving them nothing. They don't even honor a Sabbath. Three times a month. Because our view is looking at the world. It's like, hey, world, look how good I'm doing. The view has to be on Christ. The view has to be that he is our view. And, and how do we know that we're giving up our life to him? All throughout the New Testament, it talks about how we should die to ourselves to live for him. So Malachi 1, 1 through 2, 9. This, this verse uh, hit me pretty good this week. And it's, it's talking to Israel. Malachi is talking to them. And it's talking about them giving their offerings to God. And, and it says, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? So God is talking to Israel. He says, I have loved you, but you keep telling us, how have you loved us? How have you loved us, God? Many times we do that, right? Man, my life is so hard. It's so sorry. God, you, how do, you, do you even love me? It says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet Jacob I have loved and but Esau have hated or, or not preferred, and laid waste his mountain and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate place. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. So he's talking about Edom or Esau. So your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the borders of Israel. A son honor his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, 
where's my honor? So God is talking to Israel and saying, hey, look, a son honors his father, and a servant will honor his master, but I am the father. I'm the main one. And where's my honor? How do you honor me? Where is, if I'm a master, where is my reverence? Do you really ever care about what I think? Do you even care about the thoughts of me? So if we're in here in, in service, let's just have an example. And his word is read. His word is read. We say this is the word of God and we say it's read. And we're like talking through it. Or we don't find value in it. Are we giving reference? I'm reading his word to you and we don't give it reverence? That's what he's saying. Says the Lord of hosts to my priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? That's us, right? We're the priests of the nations and we'll say, I haven't despised his name. I hadn't done anything to, to make light of him. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible? He's saying, you, you give me offerings of your leftovers. You give me offerings of your low value. We'll over here give our clothes that we don't use anymore, and we'll say, oh, look at me, I gave something to God. Yes, God, this is yours. I'm done with it. It's yours. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Treat a governor or your mayor the way you treat God. The way you listen to God. The way you speak to God. Go try that to the president or to a mayor. The way you show up to their functions, show up to his that way. The things you bring to their functions, treat him that way. Like, think about that. God convicted me a while back. Like, when I, we come to church, a lot of times like, oh, man, I got to hurry up and get some stuff together. What do I, what I got in the fridge? Okay. Got some rice and beans. I'll bring that to the function today. But we're saying... I'm coming to God's celebration, biggest celebration, and I'm going to bring just what I have left over. So what does that show? And the thing is, I don't want you to feel like, oh, Nathan, you're not thankful for what I brought. It's not that. It shows my heart. That showed my heart that I was going to bring something to him for his people that was just left over. So that tells me my heart what was in my heart was that this doesn't matter. This isn't that very important. That's what I'm saying. And many of us, that's what we say when we're saying back to God when we show up like, hey, there's nothing for me to do here. Let's, let's me go make church all about me. Let me go make this all about me. We're saying back to our creator of all things, this is what I offer you. It's like, would you offer that to a governor, to this president? But now entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hand, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you who would shut the doors, so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun even to this going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. He's saying, hey, look, what's going to be offered to me is going to be the best. And the nations around you will know, wow, that is their God. And like, so our hearts be what? That, okay, 
I've been given halfway to God. I've been given halfway to God. Half, like, it's all his, but I'm like, just give him what's left over. With my time, with my money, with my stuff. But he's saying that, hey, look, I'm going to have the people who's going to give the best. And the nations are going to worship him because they see that those people really believe that he is God and king. But you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? This really hit me. Like hopefully it hits you in the same way. Like God is talking to Israel and saying that, look, you're giving me the leftovers, the things that you don't want. That's what you're giving to God. And like, I want you to eat in here. You might be thinking right now, it's like, man, someone needs to hear this. Someone on the outside needs to hear this. You need to hear this. <laughs> if you're not giving your life to Christ, if you have not completely given your life to Christ, and says that my time is his time, my stuff is his stuff, I'm going to give him the best of it. You've missed it. But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifice to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. And now, O priest, that's you, this commandment is for you. If you will he- not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse among you. And I will curse your blessing. Yes, I will, have curse it. I will have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. I don't need to comment on that. He says, look, if you don't take this to heart, I'm going to send a cursing to you. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your face, the refuse of your solemn feast, and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. So God, why did he give you the covenant? Because you feared him. Because you said, man, I, I want to be reverent when I come before God. I, want, I see he's the king of kings. I want to serve him. That's what we did, right? All of us, we said that. We said, man, I, he is the king of kings. I want to serve him. And then you get to that point in your life and you start making it be it's like, Ah, oh, it's just mundane. It's just, why don't I give this to God? He's okay with that. He's merciful and kind. Let me, that's all I got left. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. So used to, Levi walked with God. And he turned people away from iniquity. And his heart was to serve God. And then after a while, he became all about himself. And that can be us. We can be at one time, man, I used to be so concerned with the gospel. I was so concerned with turning people away from their sins, turned back to the Father. Then all of a sudden, it became about me. Then it became about my stuff. All about me. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. That's us. We are the messengers of the Lord of hosts. Think about that. Think about that honor. The God of all creation has chosen you to be his messenger. Isn't that amazing? Like, he's chosen me to go tell the world about how good he is, how wonderful he is. And I'll treat him like this. Maybe I might have a little time to give to him. I might have a little time to give to him sometime. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. When I read that, man, it hit me. And God's been doing that already in, in my life. He's been really putting it on me. Like, 
Are you, have you given it all, Nathan? Have you given it all? Are you just giving what's left? Are you just giving what's left over? We are the priests to the nations. And just like that was to Levi's to us. And many of us are just giving leftovers to him. And you can over here think like, man, that person's not here today. They are giving their leftovers. Man, they're giving their leftovers. But I want you to really question yourself. Do you give God the best? Or is it like, hey, I've already, I've harvested the, harvest the field now. We got some more, I've got a little bit left right here. I'm going to bring this to God. Use all my energy in the week. I'm going to serve God when I'm older. You ever heard that? When I get older and I retire, I'm going to start serving God then. You kids can say that. Hey, when I get older, I'll start serving God. I'll start living for God. When I get older, when my kids get older, then, then I can start actually doing stuff for them when my kids get older. I can, start, I, don't, I can actually start serving God. When my kids get out of this age, I can start really doing things for God. I can start ministering to people and calling people. I just don't have time now because I'm raising these kids. And that's a, I have no time to do anything else. God, when I'm done with all this, done with my health, done with my wellness, maybe I can start serving you. We'll give our leftover money, we'll give our leftover time, our leftover clothes, our leftover speech. When we're in a conversation, God, lead me to who you want me to speak to. I'll speak all about this world, all about this world, and then I'll mention something about God. You're a priest of the king, a messenger of the king. The most important thing you speak on is his kingdom. Matthew 6, 33, we know this one by heart, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So the most important thing in your life should be to seek the kingdom of God. That should be the most important thing in this life. And I'll tell you, like, in many times in my life, I had all these goals. I want to be the president of ULM. I want to be the president of CenturyLink. And I could care less, really, if I looked at my heart, what God's plan was for my life. And many of us, even nowadays, we can say, man, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, and then I'll do God's work on the side. It should be, I'm going to do God's work, and wherever he leads me to inside, whatever job I'm in, I'll go there. But then we have all this great dissatisfaction, because we're over here like, I'm unsatisfied with being in this spot, because we're still focused on us instead of on him and his kingdom. So do you give God the first priority in your life? Like, do you? Like, do you give God first priority? Do you give God the first of your time or what's left over? And look, the reason we're talking about this today is because we're supposed to be preparing our hearts for the king to come. That's what we're supposed to do. So it might be a really hard subject, but we're supposed to be preparing our heart for the king to come. Are we excited about him to come? Do we want him to come? Well, but if we're in this life, we're only serving ourselves, can we really say we're excited about him coming? Do you give God the first of your money or only what you have left over? I got a little bit, I can, I can give this to God. Oh, this person, this need came up in this person's life. I see the need. I've already given my tithe. This is my money. I earned it. So I'll give you all that next. Can you wait till next month? I can help your need. Maybe next month I can, I'll can help your need whenever I, I don't have to give out of my own money. Like, this is my money. You ever do that? Like, I've already given my tithe money for this month. This need came up for this person, but I'm like, yeah. Um, can you just wait a couple weeks to get paid again? I, give, I have money to give you, but I've already given that tithe money. You know what that view is? That view is this is mine. That this money is mine and it's not his. But our view should be that this is his. It's all his. So whenever this need comes up of a brother, we help them. And then who gets glory? 
He does. But then if that brother waits and cries out to God, then he doesn't get glory. But like our heart should be that God is all yours. So then our view when we make decisions about our money should be, okay, God, what will you have me do with your money? God, what will you have me do with your time? What will you have me do with your kids? Because it's not my own. I've been bought with a price. Have you given up your self-ambition for the kingdom? That's probably the hardest, right? Is that the hardest? Because we all have these things that we want to accomplish in life. Man, I really want to accomplish this. And if I talk about God in this situation, I'm going to lose out on that thing that I really want to accomplish. If I really talk about God with this person, they might not like me anymore. I might not be friends because that's my self-ambition. I want to be friends with that person. And I want to lose that friendship because I'm talking about kingdom things. Or if I talk about this with the person at work, then I might lose that them move me up because... They think I'm all godly or holy roller, so I'm losing out on speaking on kingdom things because I'm worried about my self-ambition. And that can be us inside this life. So then what are we doing? This is my God. This is what's important. I'll give God what's left over. Maybe after work sometime. Maybe later I'll, I'll talk to that person again later in life when I feel a little better about it. But God convicted you to speak to them. That's giving our leftovers to the king. That's making this more important. Is the most important thing for you to speak on to people about the king or yourself? That's another hard one. So when I go to speak to people, it's like, I'm going to speak to this person. I want to tell them about how I've done this, and I want to tell them about how I've done this. I want to tell them about all these things. Man, I've done, so, I've done all these things. Let me tell you about all these things about myself. And then maybe I'll tell them about the kingdom. That's me putting me. That's all about me. Me, 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 me. But what is, what is, what is his desire? What's going to give you most fulfillment? What's going to give you peace and understanding? If you seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom in those relationships. Instead of giving him leftovers. When we are worried about completing this life's task over kingdom work, we are saying that the one who gives us life won't give us enough to complete what he's commanded. So let me explain that. You ever had time that you were like driving somewhere and you see someone who is in need and you're like, well, I need to get to this place at work. Or I need to get to meet these people at their house. Or... I had, this thing, I had to complete this task. I, if I wasn't doing this right now, I would stop and help them. Or like you're walking to go somewhere and someone tries to stop and talk to you, and you're like, oh, man, I really need to go make this copy from the copy machine, or whatever. We're just set on this task. If I do that, if I stop in that task, I'm not going to have time to do this other thing. If I stop to talk to these people about Jesus, I won't have time to do this other thing. But really, we've been bought with a price. So our whole mission is in him. And then he'll give us time to do the other things. The controller of time and energy and all things. If I do this, I won't have energy to do that. We're saying the one who controls all things can give us any more energy to complete this task that we know that we need to complete. Does that make sense? That's what we say back to God. Even though you put this person in my place, you put this person in front of me so I can speak about your kingdom, I really got to go and do this real quick. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. But really, we should be purposeful. Like our whole job, our whole life is about the kingdom. That's what our whole life is. We've been bought with this price. So whenever we come and God brings this person to your life to speak, and you're worried about that, you say, you know what? My life is his. I'm going to spend time speaking with this person right now and be purposeful with this person right now. And then I'm going to trust he's going to give me time for that later. I'm going to trust he's going to give me energy for that later because this is the most important thing. And I'm not just going to give the leftovers to God. I'm going to give him the best of my day. So 
So this is Jeremiah 7, 13. I looked for this verse all week. I couldn't find it. So then I finally texted Dara last night. I was like, hey, what's this verse? She knew it. I asked Matt earlier. He didn't know. <laughs> Jeremiah 7, 13. I was messing with him last night. It says, and now because you have done all these works as the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer. So this is God, he's speaking to him, he's to really Israel in this point. And he tells them, hey, I came to you early in the morning, and you didn't hear. I came to you early, and you did not listen. And he's saying to them that I came to meet you at these first thing, and you weren't there. You weren't listening. You, you, you didn't even spend time to hear me. And a lot of us will go and say, God's not leading my life. God's not directing me. I don't know where to go. But we don't put any time away to listen to him. We don't put any time away to pray and to obey him in prayer and saying, man, I need to, I need to spend time just by myself, being close to God. I need to, I need to put some of, of his time away I was like, why didn't God lead me? Why, didn't he, why don't I hear him? I said, like, well, I was trying to speak to you. I was trying to direct you. I was trying to speak to you, but you weren't there. I think a lot of us will probably get to God, and we'll come back and be like, God, remember my hardest time? I was like, I was really going through struggles. Why weren't you there speaking to me? He would say, oh, I spoke to you. I rose up early speaking, but you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer. And we're going to be like, oh, okay, that's what you meant by that. Do you give God the first of your time or what's left over? And are you missing what he's trying to tell you? Man, I know I have. I know I've missed lots of things. It's Matthew 10, 38 through 39. It says, If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. So that verse is said many different ways. It's actually New Living Translation, which I don't really like at all. But it says this very well. It's saying, like, if you go and you hold on to your life and hold on to this world and the things of this world... You're going to lose it. And you're going to find that it brings no closeness to God. You're going to try to hold on to these friends and hold on to these things that you think are going to give you joy. It says you're going to lose it. It says if you give up your life, then you're going to get the life that you were made for. If you give up all those things that don't matter, you're going to get the life that was made for, that you were made for. And we know that. Every, everybody in here knows that. But a lot of us were still clinging. I'm still clinging to this life, clinging to my self ambitions, clinging to things that don't matter. What does God want? What does, he, what does He want? Your first, your best. Your house is not yours, your kids are His, your money is His, your possessions are His, your time is not yours, it's His. And our attention has to change that. Ours. All of ours. So then what would that change in our life? If we start viewing it that way, what would change? Well, offense is going to leave pretty quickly. Because if someone's wasting my time, it's not my time. If someone is speaking to, if someone needs help, I'm not giving my money. If someone need someone to speak to or listen to, I'm not giving up of my time. Me. It's his. Think of how that changes things. When you come to church, it's like, oh, I'm really tired right now, and I'm just going to sleep all day. I don't really want to do that. I don't really like want to go to church today. I want to use my time to do that. It's not your time. It's not your time to do what you want to do. It's like, how do I turn to the king and ask him, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to use my time? And it will change us. You know what's going to happen? The world around you, the Gentiles around you, the ones who are not in covenant with God will look at his people, and they'll see God among you. 
because your attention has changed from being on yourself and being about him, and you'll see him interact with you. And then the world's going to be like, wow, man, look at that. They're so giving. They're so kind with their time. They're so kind. They, they're so giving. Of, they're not focused on this world. When the crazy things happen and, and our, we lose our house, we lose our kids, we lose, our, we lose all kind of, we lose the things in this world, it's not the end of our life. Why? Because it's not our own. It's not ours. Much of our anxiety comes from not wanting to lose something that's not ours. Right? We're mad that we didn't get the job. We're mad that we didn't get the pay raise. We're mad that we didn't get the, the, someone to use their time. We're mad at a lot of our, oh no, what's going to happen if I lose my life with a sickness? What's going to happen if I get sick? And what happens if I lose my kid? What happens if I... And we, we have all this anxiety about all these things that are going to happen because we view it as this ours. You view it as it's mine. When our attention shifts and says it's all his, then if I lose it, God, it's yours. I'm giving it to you. And it changes your whole view. It changes everything. God asked for us to trust him enough to give it all to him. Isn't that what he asked? Hey, give it all to me. Trust me with it. I'll work it for good. He says, I'll work all things for good to those who love me or are called according to his purpose. So the last verse is Matthew 25, 30 through, 37 through 46. Jesus gave this parable, and he's talking about people who serve him by serving others, and this is the end of it. He says, then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you, or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So Jesus is saying, whenever you see someone who's lost, doesn't know Jesus, doesn't, needs help, when you do it to them, you are doing it to Jesus. That person you're helping, you're helping like you're helping the Messiah himself. Would that change anything? Like, does that change anything? If you see the person you're helping as the Messiah himself, would that change how you treat them or how much time you give them? Does any will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse into the everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angel. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? They will answer him, saying, Surely I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into an eternal life. We have to start stop seeing things that, that, as they are our own. Why? Because it stops us from doing the work of the kingdom. It stops us from visiting those in need. It stops us from calling those in need. Well, I don't want to spend time talking to that person on the phone. Golly, it's not my time. It's not mine. And when I'm doing that, I'm doing it for the Messiah like I'm talking to him. Doesn't that change everything? Then it's like, oh, I'm going to call this person. I'm going to listen to them. They're probably going to complain to me a long time. But it's just like listening to the Messiah. It's like I'm doing a service to him. I can do that. Our service to others is a service to God. And if you're not serving others, you're not serving God. That's what he said. If you're not serving others, you're not serving him. Because he's going to say, man, I was thirsty, you're not giving me anything to drink. I was hungry, you're not giving me anything to eat. And I was naked and you're not clothed me. But like, what happens if we change our view, 
what happens if we start saying, okay, God, I want to give you the best of my life. I want to give you the best of my life. What, what happens if you kids do that? What happens if you say, you know, I'm going to give you the best of my life, God. I'm going to serve you with everything that I have, the best of who I am. So that whenever you go speak to people, you speak to them about the kingdom of God. The world will start to change. But you say, hey, I'm going to give God the leftovers. I'll give them what I, when I get old, I'll serve God. And you know what? The parents, understand this. Your kids are going to learn from you. However you act, that's what they'll know. If you give them leftovers, you say, that's not important. That's not a thing that we need to do. That's not something we have to make the most important in our life. If Bible study is not the most important thing, time that you spend together, something else is, then your kids are going to make that the most important thing in their life. If serving God is most, not the most important thing in your life, your kids will make that the most important thing in life that you do. If your only gift to others is your leftovers, it shows your heart about God. Your only gift to God is your leftovers, it should tell us what? You're not my king. You're just another person. I'm just going to give you my leftovers. I'll give you what I have left. That's what we're saying to him. Like, we would never do that to the mayor. The mayor calls me up for a meeting. I'm going to be like, I'm going to be there early. I'm going to be dressed up. I'm going to go meet with him because I know he has power in our city. If the mayor was stopped on the side of the road with his car, I'm going to stop because whew, he has a lot of power around here. If the governor stopped on the side of the road, I'm, I'm going to stop and help him. Why? Because it benefits me. But there's a king of kings on the side of the road. That's we our, our view. God asks for our first, our unblemished, and what he prescribes. And then given those things, we're declaring to him that he is our God. So we're saying, hey God, this, you are my God. I'm going to give you my best. So I know like for, for me, like thinking through this, like I think, I'm just, man, I hadn't done this. Many times I've not done this. But God says his mercies are new every morning. Every morning his nurses, mercies are new. So I don't have to keep living the life all about me. I don't have to keep living a life giving God my leftovers. I don't have to do that. I can start making it all about him. I can, I can say every morning, I can wake up and say, okay, God, this new job that you have me in, that you've directed my steps to, we lead people to me that I can speak truth to, I can share your kingdom. I can make it all about him. I saw something recently a pastor shared. He said, people don't want to hear the gospel, a well-presented gospel, from some professional, they'd much rather hear a messed up, someone who speaks poorly, that they know they'd rather hear that person tell it to them. Like each of you might think, you know what, Man, I want to bring someone to church because I can't share this. Those people don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from you who care for them. They want to hear from the people who, who love them, that they know love them. Because they, they have no reason to trust me. They have no reason to, to believe anything I say. They know you. They know you. Man, this person's really loving. They're very really kind. I'm going to listen to what they have to say. And when you make that your first priority is to share the gospel, you make it your first priority that you truly care for people, they're going to change. They're going to see that love of God. I'll read you a little portion. I, uh, there's a few more of those in the Beta Satan books, and then there might be like six or eight of these back in the back inside the box. So if anyone wants it, I just ask that you um, 
whenever you get it, you get it to use it now if you're going to use it and pass it on to somebody else. Um, here's a little snippet from it. It says, young converts need to be taught that they are neither owners of their possessions nor of themselves. Nothing is their own, their time, property, influence, facilities, body or soul. You are not your own, 1 Corinthians 6.19. They belong to God. When they submit to God, they surrender everything to Him to be ruled and disposed of at His pleasure. Christians have no right to spend even one hour of their time with their own. They really have no right to go anywhere or do anything for themselves. They should recognize that everything is at the disposable of God, and they must employ all for the glory of God. The church and its Christian members must take a firm stance regarding stewardship, recognizing that denying responsibility here can be just as serious as denying the de deity of Jesus. Everyone should also recognize that covetousness, fairly proved, can just as soon exclude a man from communion with Jesus as adultery. It is time that matters were corrected. The only way to set Christians right to begin with those who are just entering the Christian life. Young converts must be told that they are just as worthy of condemnation if they show a covetous spirit and turn a deaf ear when the whole world is calling for help, as if they were living in adultery or practicing the daily worship of idols. Continuing like this would also exclude them from the fellowship with the church. So when I was reading that, we look at our time like it is nothing. We look at it like it's mine. That's not what God wants. Like there is a world around us that's dying. We believe that. That there is a world around us that's dying. They're in complete hardship and shame and consumed by sin, a world around us. We'll be like, hey, it's my time. It's my time. You got people you work with that's going to perish and go to hell. They're going to be completely separated from God, and we're like, hey, I don't need to spend time doing that. The heart of God, like, I remember seeing this picture of myself looking at someone I love and I was there standing with God and they were standing away from God and just being like, I can't imagine that. But I'm going to go use this time that I have in this world for myself and think of how hard it would be to see a, a child or someone in this congregation being away from God or someone that you love being away from God our first priority, our number one thing must be to serve God, to share his kingdom. When Jesus prayed, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be in the name, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that prayer is not worthless. He didn't say our, your kingdom come on earth as in heaven to say that's never going to happen. He asked you to ask that for it to happen. That God's kingdom would be here on earth in the same way that it is ruled in heaven. So like our prayer is that. God, let your kingdom be here, that you rule here in the same way you rule in heaven. What's my job? Is to go share that. And I'm seeing all around us, that's what I was telling my mom, I was like, you're seeing all these churches, they're turning back to the gospel. That we need to go out and share the gospel. We need to go out and, you see it in the Messianic world, you see it in the Baptist world, in the Methodist world. Like I have all these pastors I'm friends with. And they're all coming back to say, okay, look, we have to come back and turn people to God. We're losing people out of the droves are leaving the church. They're not believing in God. They don't believe in his power. Kids are falling away. Why? Because we give God this. And we expect them to believe us. So until our attitudes change and we say, God, I'm going to give you the very best of what I am, I'm going to give you all that I am, then they're going to keep on leaving. And they're not going to believe anything you say. So I encourage you guys that you give it all, everything, and we'll change the world. Do y'all want that? Like, do y'all want to change the world? Yeah? I do. But, like, it's going to take us giving it everything. Pray with me.
Father, I thank you for your kindness and your mercy. I thank you so much that you would turn us back to you, that you would show us our weakness and show us where we are not close to you, and you show us where we have not given it at all, Father, where we've made things about us, where we have just lived for ourselves. Father, I know that you can use us. I know that you can use each person here. I ask that you would embolden them that you would fill them with your spirit, Father, and that you would bring in them a new heart that's about you, Father. Father, and that you would use this this small group of believers to be about your business, and that many would turn to you. And Father, that you would join us with other people who are trying to serve you and trying to turn people to your kingdom. Father, and that you would help us be focused on your kingdom to come. And Father, that our friends that are are hurt and lost and afraid, that that you would send us them and that you would use us, Father, to turn them from their sins and that you would use us as your right hand to go and speak to them. Father, we would be less concerned about how high and lofty we can be in this world and be more concerned about your kingdom. Father, we love you and we bless you. In your Son, Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. Anybody have any questions? Cool. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom.